Are we live? Terrific. So welcome everybody to our Facebook Live on the NAFTA 2.0 text and what comes next. We're going to talk about what could be considered phase two of the campaign to replace NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And we're very fortunate to have with us Celeste Drake. Hi, Lauren. Hello. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. So Celeste's official title is Trade and Globalization Policy Specialist at the AFL-CIO. What that translates to is the U.S. Labor Federation's top trade expert. And before that, Celeste worked on the Hill for a Democratic member of Congress who is on the Ways and Means Committee, which is the committee that covers trade. So to cut to the chase, Celeste really knows her stuff. She's one of the people I reach out to when I have to figure out and work through a Weasley trade agreement provision. And she happens to represent the US unions in a confederation, a bunch of them all together, who are a very key player in this fight over NAFTA and who have been at the center of the fair trade fights for the last several decades. So I'm going to interview Celeste and then we are going to open up to take your questions. But before we started, I wanted to situate our conversation a little bit. So NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, um, was negotiated behind closed doors with hundreds of official US trade advisors representing corporate interests. It went into effect, whoops, in January. Uh, that was not supposed to happen. It went into effect in January of 1994. And just a little bit of the background, it was George Bush's idea. And I'm not sure I understand. It, it was Ronald Reagan's idea. And he did the first half of the agreement in 1988 with Canada. Then George Bush got in, the father got involved with, got Mexico involved and added Mexico in negotiations and signed the deal in 1992. Then Clinton fought with Congress and narrowly passed the deal in 1993. And the bottom line of the whole history there is, unlike what Donald Trump says about somehow NAFTA being this thing that Mexico did to stick it to US workers, unfortunately, NAFTA is a made in America problem by numerous presidents. And now that it's been in effect for 25 years, it's done serious damage to workers across North America, to the environment across North America. And part of what we're gonna talk about today is what kind of changes have to happen to that old agreement to make it something that actually works for people and the planet. So a lot of people know that NAFTA has already caused a lot of job loss here. There are almost a million jobs certified under one narrow government program. And we know tens of thousands of factories have closed and communities have been devastated. But I just want to flag for folks what happened in Mexico. Because even though a lot of people in Mexico are working very hard in very fancy, many US multinational plants, brand new, they're getting paid between two and three dollars an hour. Real wages in Mexico are down since NAFTA. It's gotten worse for workers in Mexico. And of course, NAFTA displaced several million small farmers. So no doubt, migration to the US from Mexico doubled in the first decade of NAFTA. NAFTA devastated millions of livelihoods in Mexico. We think about what happened here, but it's been a bad deal for working people throughout North America. So that big fight in the 90s is what birthed the fair trade movement that brought together unions and consumer groups and environmental groups and family farm groups. We all been kind of fighting with each other and then we realized this kind of corporate power grab branded as a trade agreement actually united all of our goals and values. And if we were together, we might have a chance in trying to stop more of those kind of agreements. NAFTA hatched the model of corporate rig trade agreements. And it's been repeated ever since right through TPP. So here we are. NAFTA renegotiations started last August. A deal of a renegotiated NAFTA was published in September, on September 30th of this year. It's gonna be signed on November 30th, so imminently after Thanksgiving. And what, what we're gonna to do today is talk about basically 
what is in that NAFTA 2.0 tax, because we don't call it by the new name that Donald Trump gave it. He's trying to rebrand it like it's a brand new thing. Unfortunately, this is not the transformational replacement of NAFTA we've all been fighting for. On the other hand, as you're going to hear from Celeste, if the labor and environmental standards are really made subject to swift and certain enforcement and some other important improvements were made, a new deal could stop some of the ongoing serious damage to people on the planet in North America. So as we sort of delve into the whole what's in the text and what has to happen, I just want to flag for people one of what I think is the best reviews of it. So one of the things Celeste did, she's, she is the person for the Labor Advisory Committee who wrote this excellent report, the LAC report on what's in NAFTA. Folks probably have seen online our little checklist analysis. It's the bulleted form of how it measures up against our demands. But this, this is the contents. This is the really detailed set of analyses. And so I want to just start with Celeste by asking, can you give us basically the 30,000 foot overview of how what end up in the text, because we actually have the tome here, here's the new text. How does that measure up to what the AFL-CIO demanded, generally? I mean, the one word answer is kind of meh. Yeah. You know, and I, I would direct folks to this, and and the, the authors, of course, are President Trumka and uh, the other labor presidents, but I am their key assistant. And I would direct you to this. It's about 30 something pages long. And then you get to the back and you're like, oh, there's another 30 something pages. That was our recommendations so that people can actually compare one to the other. But there's about two pages and it's section five where we go through the 18 things that we suggested and say, you know, did they, did the new nap to get there or not? And generally, Unfortunately, the answer is no, but there's enough places that are important where they made some progress, which is why we think we still need to be in the game. So there's some progress on key areas like investment, like labor, there's some auto rule of origin improvements. There's a little bit on trade enforcement outside the labor area that, that sort of make it worth it that we say we've got to keep you know, pulling on that rope in this tug of war rather than walk away because the current NAFTA is so bad that meaningful improvements, even if they don't go all the way, could make a really big difference to jobs and wages, not just in the US, but to Mexico and Canada as well. So that that's a really interesting perspective. So I guess, can we have a little bit of a guided tour on some of the key chapters? And maybe we should start with the labor chapter because I think as Celeste just said, unless the real labor and environmental standards, unless wages and conditions come up in Mexico, US companies are gonna keep outsourcing. That's right, that's exactly right. Wages are gonna get pushed down, they're still gonna dump toxins, and they're gonna bring that stuff back here to sell, yeah. which has been the 25 years of NAFTA. So tell us a little bit about what is in that labor chapter, the good, the bad, the unfinished, et cetera. Okay, so let me start with a little bit about why the, it's so important to get the labor chapter right. And amongst the many things that NAFTA did, right? It gave so much power to corporations to have a private justice system. It didn't protect the environment, you know, on and on and on. With labor, it's not just two countries with different labor systems or just two countries at different stages of development. And, you know, if Mexico develops, it will eventually get there. Which was the old promise. Right, that was the promise. It, it's gonna bring a new middle class to Mexico and they're gonna buy our product. Right? That didn't happen because that's not what the core of the problem is. The core of the problem in Mexico is that there's this unholy alliance. It's a trifecta against workers and it's what are known as protection unions or yellow unions. So essentially organizations that are highly linked to the political parties in power and that masquerade as unions and get in the way of real unions. So that's one piece of the triangle. The second is the government, which has essentially an implicit development theory that says, let's keep wages down and let's keep labor rights down so that we can attract more investment. So race to the bottom. Race to the bottom. And then of course, 
the bad actor employers that say, that looks really attractive. Let's go there, let's invest there, let's create jobs that are bad jobs, that deny people's rights, that exploit people and the environment and do this. And so you've got to undo this unholy alliance and this trifecta. And it's not just an accident and it's not just that Mexico is less developed. It's really a systematic decision to suppress workers' rights, to keep them from having a voice in work. They can't speak up to say our workplace is unsafe because they could be fired. They can't join together and collectively negotiate a new contract because they could be fired. And then it gets much worse. Even just in the 18 months that the new NAFTA has been being renegotiated, three workers who were pushing for an independent union at the Torex gold mine in Mexico, a Canadian owned gold mine, right? So it's really exemplifies the NAFTA, NAFTA company. They were assassinated, they were killed and there's no investigation, no one's been arrested. And what is this? This is worker intimidation. And it says to all other workers, not just at that mine, but any worker who wants to form an independent union in Mexico, it says to them, you're putting your life in your hands if you do this. So perhaps you better not do it because you may not be coming home from work the next day. So this is why the labor chapter is the first, second and third priority. If we don't get that right, all the other stuff doesn't matter. So just we'll jump in yeah. for one second, because for folks who I know the folks who are with us who were there at the original NAFTA fight, but for folks who are catching up, the old NAFTA tax has is packed, it's called a trade agreement. It's packed with protections that make it easier for corporations to outsource jobs. It makes it cheaper, less risky, but there are no enforceable protections for workers or the environment. So it's literally a thumb on the scale that says, look at this system. It locks in that system by saying, we're rewarding you with all these special protections to have corporations go there. So then what's happened in the renegotiation? Yeah, so, so they brought that original deal back and we're sort of told, oh yeah, oops, we forgot about labor and the environment. And they came up with these side agreements that made it more politically attractive for this certain, is in 93, right? 93 members of Congress to vote for. So they're there. We have tried to use them. Unions have tried to use them. Labor advocacy groups have tried to use them. They've been useless. So part of what's happened in this one is we've taken the side agreement. We've brought it into the formal text, mm -hmm. which means theoretically it's enforceable and we'll, we'll get to that. And then what are the level of obligations? That's critical. Are they easy rules? Are they hard rules? They're decent rules. They are better than the, the so-called May 10th rules that were a step up in 2007 and that applied in Peru, Colombia, Panama, and Korea. Those are rules that when the Democrats last took a majority in 2006, they made George W. Bush renegotiate a bunch of his agreements. And that's the standard that's been the standard, but it hasn't really worked out. Right. And I think everyone active in the fair trade community would say May 2007 wasn't great, mm -hmm. but it was a step. Mm -hmm. So it's above that. And then there were these very minuscule improvements over May 10th in the TPP, which we all rejected as not good enough. So these standards are even higher than that. And the important things that I will mention are, and that there are a number of improvements. They actually specify that the right to be paid minimum wage includes not just the minimum wage, but the other legally binding things your employer must pay for you. So when your employer must pay into the social security system on your behalf, that's part of the minimum wage. And this is something that employers do in the United States, but even more so in Mexico and in other developing countries. So that's a meaningful improvement. Second, it specifies that freedom of association, the general right to join with other workers and, and form a union and, and activate for better includes the right to strike. And that's huge. If you don't have the right to strike, what is the leverage you can exert on your employer? So that's big. A third thing is it actually says that violence designed to intimidate workers is a violation of the trade agreement, where I just mentioned that three workers had been assassinated just in the last 18 months. We've heard from the U.S. government in the past, violence isn't a trade issue. It's clearly an issue. If you can threaten to injure workers or injure them or kill them to prevent them from exercising any kind of collective rights, then you have effectively said you have no right 
to decent pay, decent safety, any of these things. So those are big. And then in particular, how do you overcome this entrenched system I described in Mexico, where you have this trifecta of fake unions and the government and bad employers pushing wages down and keeping unions out of the workplace? Well, you include here what's known as the labor annex between the US and Mexico, and it specifies certain improvements, certain reforms that Mexico must make to its labor law in order to comply with NAFTA. And Mexico has been on this path slowly for the past couple of years. And it's got a new Congress that looks like it might actually enact these laws and a new president that might actually sign these laws. And none of this is a given. So that's where we get to the unknowns and the enforcement. But the architecture for change not to make it perfect, not to solve everything overnight, but the architecture to make sure that employers have to respect the right of unions to exist and the government has to defend it when inevitably the employers and the employees clash, that architecture is in there and that could be meaningful if there's swift and certain enforcement. And that's where we have a real question. So we're gonna to get to the enforcement, but I actually have a question, which yeah. is, is that annex the thing that people say could help get rid of the protection contracts? That's what they're talking about. And that's still sort of if, right? Because the annex doesn't make Mexico change its laws. And the question is, how would you enforce that annex? So okay. it's really, the it's up to Mexico and Mexico has to do what sovereign nations do is it's Congress has to come together and say, how do we do this? How do we reform our labor laws? And do so in a timely manner, right? Because if it's just a promise to do so at a later date, you know, we've seen those promises before. Mexico promised way back in 93 that it was going to improve. The Central American countries, they all promised to improve. Colombia promised to improve, right? And we just don't see it. So it's a matter of Mexico doing what really needs to be done. And how does the U.S. sort of monitor that and say, we're not just taking a promise, but we don't move ahead with the rest of the NAFTA until this part is finished. And that's really critical. So it's the timing and the enforcement piece. And the text doesn't yet make clear that the NAFTA will not, cannot rules in the agreement go into effect unless and until. So that's, that is one of the things we yeah, have to make it's sure. It's got some tips, but those it says it is the expectation that Mexico will have changed its law by January 1st, 2019. How do you enforce it is the expectation? So how do you enforce it? <laughs> well, one of the things that we have talked to the administration and to Congress about is in the implementing legislation, if NAFTA goes ahead. So the way that these trade agreements get enacted into law for folks who don't follow this all the time is Congress votes on the implementing bill. So a law is written to say then this new NAFTA is the law of the land. And you could include in there for instance, an independent body that would certify Mexico's made the changes in its law that are needed, the deal can now go ahead into law. Or you could say the administration has to work with Congress, which includes you know, the House, which may be more friendly to labor rights. We assume now that hands will change in the House as of January 3rd, 2019. So you could write into the law exactly how it will be determined. Will it be independent labor experts? Will it be Congress in conjunction with the administration? But if you just leave it up to the president, and this is, it doesn't matter which president, because we've seen it both ways. We've seen it both ways. What presidents end up doing is wanting to move ahead with these deals quickly. They have a lot of folks demanding new trade agreements now, and we don't want this to be glossed over because it's the key part of improving NAFTA. So you've got to have checks and balances and they've got to be written into the law. So the guy who's the trade representative now is the most likely US chair I've ever seen to enforce any of this stuff, yeah. honestly, but he's not gonna be there forever. <laughs> so that I think is the key piece is the yes. enforcement and not just to the labor standards, but also the environmental standards. And that, that kind of gets to a related question when it just jumped to next, which it sounds like the, the labor standards are modestly but meaningfully improved. Yeah. And that annex could be a thing. I mean, if that gets enforceable, that, you know, I have heard some labor folks say that could be transformational as far as people really getting real unions in, in Mexico. But what about the environmental standards? 
So environment and labor have kind of moved along a parallel track historically. They were both side agreements. They both had some improvements in May 10th. They both have never really ever been enforced historically. And so we see some of the things that happen with labor happen with environment. So it went from a side agreement in, this. in, the, in the new draft would be in the text. Uh, it, but then when you look at some of the other things I mentioned, it doesn't really live up to even the May 10th. The May 10th had seven specific, what they call multilateral environmental agreements. So agreements between many countries to protect the ozone layer or endangered species, right? All of these things. And this one really doesn't have that. It has somewhat minimal standards. So certainly improved over side agreement in the original NAFTA, but not what any of us were looking for. And certainly doesn't address climate change, but we wouldn't expect this particular president, unfortunately, to. Um, it does have another improvement in the environment in that it got rid of this provision in the original NAFTA where you have to proportionally trade energy, and that's a good thing for the environment. But when you look overall, there were not as many advances. And that's unfortunate because when we're ticking down the list of things that these corporations look for when they're looking to outsource jobs and the things that attract them, the ability to abuse and exploit people is one. And frankly, the ability to abuse and exploit the environment is another. So that's too bad there was not as much progress. But even so, what would make the environmental chapter really meaningful hinges on the same as the labor in that there's got to be swift and certain enforcement. If you just have this theoretical enforceability, look, there's a rule, it says shall, it's enforceable, but you don't have a way to turn the idea that it's enforceable into you know, some kind of carrot and stick on the trading partner that says you're out of compliance. It's not that meaningful. And that's really where we've been for the past quarter century. And that's why if we get really swift and certain enforcement, you know that another party is gonna come after you if you don't comply with the rules, that's when they start following the rules, right? So that's so what we need. The, the, I mean, the, the enforcement issue seems like it's like the crux, like it may not be sufficient to make this worth enacting, but it's certainly necessary. And the, on the environment issue, as someone who was in that original NAFTA fight, those proportionality rules were miserable because it required you to keep exporting, not just energy, but water, lake water. If you ever commodified it, you traded it once, it was commodified, timber, minerals. You had to keep exporting based on the average of your previous three years exports, even if you decide to conserve something or ban its sale domestically. So that was, that was a terrible provision, but that's just out. So the issue is with the chapter on environment and the rules that are in there, fishery rules are a little bit better than what was in TPP, but the rest of it, I mean, the Endangered Species Treaty meets the old May 10th standard. Meets the standard, but, but the rest of it could use some muscling up, but if it's yes. not enforceable. If it's not enforceable, none of it matters. matters. It's all, it's all yeah. None of it matters. And, and there are some other, you know, when I said, meh, there are some other good things. I mean, I think that the progress that they've made on investor to state dispute settlement is tremendous. We and said that it should be gone. There, right? That's such a big it's environmental huge. issue. That it's was like huge. the number one environmental it's demand. It's huge. And it should be gone, right? We, we all stipulate that it's a bad system. It's unjust. It's unfair. But it's going to be gone after three years with Canada. Yay. And it's severely rolled back with Mexico so that all investors can access the system, but only to complain about actual takings, actual expropriations. We the took government the, takes right? your property. The government takes this and building. And doesn't give you any money. Yeah, and doesn't do that. And violate discrimination, what they call national treatment and most favored nation treatment. And you have to actually show the discrimination. And most of the mischief, to be honest, in ISDS is in two other places. Indirect expropriations, where you say, ah, they did a regulation, or I went to court and I lost, or somehow it amounts to an indirect taking, which you can play around with. And as lawyers, we both know, you can play around with that a lot. And then the other one, they call minimum standard of treatment, which includes the right to fair and equitable treatment, which again, so vague, so, so over, 
Mischief, mischief, mischief. So those two claims are gone for most investors. And then there's this special category of highly privileged investors that will keep the entire suite. The old system. The old entire suite of, of claims where they can make a lot of mischief. And that's going to be available to, as folks who are following this may know, uh, companies that have contracts with the national government of Mexico or the national government of the United States. And they're in certain areas, oil and gas, transportation, telecommunications, roads, rail, canals. So that's bad, but it's certainly much better than what we have now. And we think that's real. How is that related to jobs and wages? Well, when you have that for the manufacturing sector, for Ford, for Whirlpool, for Carrier, for Mondelez, for any of these, they could actually use that as another reason to take their manufacturing south of the border or for AT&T and Verizon to take their call centers south of the border. Because if Mexico ever did a regulation, a law, a judicial decision, and a minimum wage that they didn't like, they would use it. And they would say, wait a minute, we invested here on the thought that we were going to get X profits. And now it looks like we might get X minus one and therefore we're going to sue. So it does reel back on some of the outsourcing incentives. Again, not totally gone, but it's better and it's meaningfully better. I think that annex is one of the, the exception for the companies or the contracts is one of the places that improvements could be made because the way it's written right now, what it really covers is oil and gas companies. If you look right now about who has the kind of contracts that are covered with the federal governments, the other sectors really aren't real. I mean, in the future, something could happen. But really, what that boils down to is there are nine U.S. companies with 13 oil and gas contracts. And those guys get grandfathered in with a broad set of rights. And that needs to get whacked back. Because otherwise, in addition to all of those rights that Celeste mentioned are gone. So is the right to invest. There are no more rights to invest. Mm -hmm. It's called pre-establishment technically. But like for folks who know that horrible Bill Con case where a mine did an environmental impact statement, the government said, oh, we don't want that mine there. It's going to be bad for people in the environment. And the company said, sorry, we have NAFTA rights to invest. Give us the money. So that stuff is gone too. And so is the right for the tribunalists, the corporate lawyers who hear the cases to rotate between being judges and suing governments. A bunch of good stuff got done. But then there is that leftover business for the oil and gas companies that needs to get cleaned up. And they use it. And right? use I mean, it. when you think about big cases, hmm, Chevron, Occidental, right? So right. It, it really is that extractive sector. And it often is, unfortunately, about the environment and what regulations, right? And sort of the Lone Pine. So that case. needs to get rolled so, back. So that's a problem. But that's another, that's another thing that has moved in the right direction. And I would say, the auto rule of origin is another. Well, I was just going to say there are two <laughs> things that seem to have corporate America particularly pissed off about this agreement at this point. That is the major whacking of ISDS and strengthening of rules of origin, which is the next thing I wanted to ask you about. You know, we keep hearing about the $16 wage limit, that wage requirement. That's part of the rule of origin, but also there are broader changes in the rule of origin. Yeah. And a bunch of companies seem to have their underwear in a bundle over this, which probably means it could be potentially good for workers. It could be, yeah. It's very innovative. So I want to start there, and, and and Ambassador Lighthizer should get a lot of credit for being really innovative here. We don't really know how it'll work and if it'll really work, but kudos for being innovative. And folks may have been wondering, why didn't I mention the $16 an hour in the labor section? It's not it's in the not labor in section. There. It's part of the rule of origin. So just to be clear, what's a rule of origin? It says for every particular good, whether it's an Oreo cookie, um, an automobile, a table, a chair, anything that's crossing a border. Celeste cool shoes. <laughs> what rule, how much of it has to be made in the NAFTA zone in Canada, the US and Mexico in order to get the NAFTA benefit, which is the tariff benefit, which is generally means zero. If you meet the rule of origin, you pay no tariffs. So for a car in the original NAFTA, it was 62.5%. So a majority of the car had to be made in Canada, the US, or Mexico. And but a third could come from China and still get NAFTA? Yeah. Not only that, but 
the 62 and a half percent had lots of loopholes. Mm -hmm. So for one thing, if you put in a part that met the part rule of origin by being, let's say 50% made in America, once you put it in, the whole thing counted as made in America. So you're whacking away because you're able to what's called roll up. Another loophole was they just created a, a tracing list and they said, here are all the parts in a car. Imagine all the parts in a car that were in 1993 that aren't now. Like, I don't know of any car that's made with a carburetor now, for instance, and all the parts that you have now that you didn't have in 1993. The entire communication system. Yeah, the GPS system, all kinds of, you know, cameras, CPU, semiconductors, all of that. So once it wasn't on the tracing list, the answer was, we'll just deem it. We'll deem it made in NAFTA. So, so really you had cars that were like 40% or something. Potentially, right? 50%, 40%, who knows? So in the new rule, starts off at 75%, so higher than 62.5%. Um, it gets rid of deeming. It tries to address roll up for critical parts. And I think we're ha still having some discussions about how that'll work. So we'll see. Um, and then, so those are sort of overall more in North America, less in China or Thailand or elsewhere where they haven't made the NAFTA promises. So that's a start. But then comes the question, where in North America? Where in North America? We were just talking about Mexico and the draw because you can abuse people and abuse the environment. So to sort of make sure that every country gets a piece of that auto supply chain and it doesn't just become a Mexico only supply chain, they put in what they call this labor value content. And the labor value content says, that for a car, 40% of it has to be made with workers who are being paid an average of $16 an hour. And for a light truck, 45%. And mm -hmm. it's because the light trucks are more valuable. They tried to capture a little more. And that $16 an hour really isn't designed to change the minimum wage in Mexico. It's really designed to make sure that Canada and the US get some portion of the value chain. Now, again, there's a lot of questions of that 40%. You know, some of it is deemed where they need it because of R&D and IT expenditures. And if those are done in Mexico, those workers may not be paying, you know, being paid $16. So there's a lot of questions about how it will work. But the general idea that you're trying to say every country gets a piece of the supply chain is a good and innovative thing to do. And that's so that's a, in the plus column. Is it going to bring back the entire auto parts supply chain that's gone to Mexico? Will no. Ross, who said this, <laughs> he crazy. Said, it's unfortunate because you shouldn't, if you want folks to trust that trade is going to get better, which a lot of folks don't trust that it ever will get better. You, you can't, <laughs> it's absurd, right? To promise that all these factories are going to move back. What you're trying to do with a good trade agreement at this point is to influence that next decision. Where's the next plant going to be built? How are the workers who populate it going to be paid? How are they going to be treated? What rights will they have? And those are the questions. And if we can put a thumb on the scale that's back towards high pay, high benefits, labor rights, more jobs in the U.S., that's a good thumb to have. We can't go back and undo everything in the past. And anybody who makes such promises, it's just outrageous. Right. But we can say, is this something that might work? It might. And that we're looking stop at all some those of the damage details. going yeah. forward. Yeah. I mean, it seems like that is super innovative just as a concept to attach wages to market access. That seems like it should be basic, which is if you don't want to race to the bottom, set a floor. Um, another place that's kind of like that, which I just want to throw out there as folks are thinking about the pros and cons, is the currency issue where for the first time in a trade agreement, there's actual language in the core tax that actually has some obligations that are binding. Unfortunately, the only binding ones are to provide information that could help the US figure out if a country was cheating. It's not really a big issue with Mexico and Canada, but it's a kind of interesting thing to you know start down the path, just like the linkage of wages and market access. But here's a place where the companies are really happy, and that's a problem. And that's Big Pharma seems pretty celebratory about the language yeah. and intellectual pa uh, property patents for medicine. So what can you tell us about that? That seems worrisome. It is worrisome. And it's, it's really worrisome for, for working families because we know one thing. 
working families just before the last election told pollsters right, left and center that their number one issue was health care nationwide. So if a new trade agreement is going in the wrong direction on health care, that's a problem. Because here's the thing that we haven't really talked about. And, you know, we could do a whole nother Facebook live chat. But essentially what these trade agreements do, because they cover so much more than tariffs and quotas, they essentially put a box around our democracy and they say, these are the things that you can do. These are the things that you can't. You can have these regulations and rules. You can't have these. And in, in the case of medicines, it's you must have these. You must have these rules. And what do these rules do? Well, they're a giant giveaway to brand name pharmaceutical companies. So the original, this is the place where the original NAFTA was better because it kind of said very little about medicines. And that's a good thing because <laughs> we all got to make choices. And in this case, Canada has made better choices than the U.S. in terms of pharmaceuticals for their domestic policies. And the U.S. now is trying to lock in the bad U.S. choices across the continent. So what are these bad choices? One, there is an intellectual property right that is not known unless you're a real trade or health policy wonk. It's in addition to your patent rights. Most people have heard of patent rights and it's called exclusivity. So it's a period that may extend your patent right. It may run at the same time. There, there's a lot of choices, but essentially in the US it says for these companies that produce the really expensive, innovative medicines. So Sovaldi, a lot of the things that you see on TV and you see the ads for that are going to help with arthritis or these kinds of things, these are biologic drugs. They're not made from chemicals. They're grown essentially in a lab. They get in under US law, 12 years of exclusivity. So over and above the patent rights, they get 12 years. And that's 12 years that a generic version can't come onto the market. Well, here's what happens. In the new NAFTA, it says across all three countries, they have to have 10 years of exclusivity. And the folks that are for this say, well, isn't that great? It's two years less than what the US requires. No, we want no obligation for that. Locked in. Because we wanna be able to reduce 12 years. The 12 years is why these companies are advertising on TV so heavily for these drugs because they're huge money makers. They might be $20,000 a month, in some cases, $80,000 a month or more. So we don't want to lock it in. The other things that it does is gives a very wide definition of what are the drugs that are covered by this exclusivity. So that's an expansion. It also says something that's consistent with US law, but would prevent us from doing the good type of reform that you have to allow some form of evergreening of a patent. Now, this is really, I think, the most ridiculous. It means when a drug company says this isn't going to be a capsule anymore, it's going to be a liquid or we're going to have it in a different amount or the pill is going to be a blue triangle instead of a pink hexagon, they get a new patent on it. Seriously, because it's a new mode, right? Or they say, oh, and now we know that it treats, you know, arthritis in addition to psoriasis. Now it's a new use and they get another pack. They haven't invented anything new, right? But they get to gouge us for an additional 20 years under the patent. So these are the kinds of things that the new NAFTA does that limit our choices as a society to address healthcare costs. And there's even a rule, it's called the Drug Pricing Transparency Annex, that some folks look at and say, wow, I think that's in there to try and deter us from changing Medicare Part D to a system where the US government negotiates drug prices. So there's a lot in there that oughtn't to be if what we're trying to do for working families is lower healthcare costs. So that's a big deal. I mean, the one good thing about that annex, because that was in TPP, is because there is no ISDS claim now for yes. the kinds of weaselly minimum standard of treatment, that provision is practically not enforceable. That chapter is not subject to dispute settlement. And without ISDS, it's not language you'd want because it basically creates an expectation for yes. the pharmaceutical yeah. firms to be at the table 
when the government programs are making decisions about what they'll reimburse, what the price should be. But on the other hand, there's no way to go after the government on that one. But that other stuff, I mean, the way to think about it really is it locks in place the bad policies here and it exports them. Because right now, Mexico has zero biologics exclusivity. Canada only at this point has eight years. So we export our badness there and then we lock ourselves in. So in a future Congress and a future president says, we're getting rid of this 20 year of monopoly patent is enough. No, we'd have a free trade agreement having a monopoly locked in for a pharmaceutical company. So that's gotta get, that's gotta get fixed. So as we're looking at the whole sort of mix of it before, before Celeste was a, was a lawyer, she was a teacher. So I'm wondering if we can do a little bit of grading here, because then yeah. we need to jump to what we need to do to try and make this something that passes, which is not passes Congress, but passes muster. So we want to even have it considering passing Congress. So what, what kind of a grade would you give the original NAFTA? I personally give it like a one on a scale of one to 10. Yeah, if I can't go below one, it gets a one. <laughs> it gets a one. All right, we're in agreement. And now the NAFTA, the NAFTA 2.0 tax got its improvements got its big problems the pharmaceutical stuff and there's a bunch of unfinished business what grade do you give that one you know what what we've decided is to sort of um not give it a grade okay. essentially give it a needs improvement <laughs> you know what we're saying is you know it. and sometimes i would do right sometimes you get the piece of paper you know from the student and you would say you've just failed right and there are different grades of failing right because essentially everything below 60% is a fail. And sometimes you say, this just isn't done. And I don't want to grade it because it's not your best work. And I think you can do better. And that's essentially what the labor movement has done. If you look at the labor advisory committee report and you look at what they've said, they said, we're refraining from being forward against it or giving a final evaluation because we think there's, there's really some things you can do there that might get it up to, you know, if not a passing grade, at least where we felt like, okay, now it's really done and now the grade is the grade, Yeah, right? So that, that's basically our take too for what it's worth. And so that brings up the very obvious next question, which is what the hell do we do to get <laughs> improved? So you sort of gotten a little bit of a guided tour. And again, I wanna send you back to looking at the details in the LAC report or look at on tradewatch.org our website feature, if you, if you want more of the Cliff Notes version, that sort of bullets. But either way, you know, there's some things in there that head in the right direction. There's some places where more work could make yeah. things that were walking down the right road actually get to the right place. And then there's just some bad stuff that's gonna have to come out. So how the hell do we do that? <laughs> so the thing that's the key take home is when this agreement gets signed on November 30th, that is not the end of the story. It, there will be a lot of triumphalism by Trump saying he's, you know, cured cancer and I don't know he's walking on the moon. But <laughs> the reality is that's just a step in the process, because in the past, totally signed, finished. They're so done. They're they're gathering dust in a shelf someplace trade agreements that both, say, George W. Bush and President Obama had signed and were done with. Congress just said, "Uh, -uh that is not something we're going to pass and they made them go back and fix it. So you've got both the implementing legislation where important things need to be done. Yep. You've got provisions that agreement that, you know, it's signed, but so what? If an agreement cannot get passed, if that implementing legislation that Celeste mentioned cannot get a majority in both the House and the Senate, then there's no deal. So when it looks like there can't be a majority, that's when things get fixed. So from my perspective, I'm gonna ask Celeste about her view about this, but the most important thing we should all be doing right now to try and get this agreement to a place where at least it stops the ongoing damage or some of it. Because it's the damage, you know, there are a million jobs lost. There are all those folks in Mexico who got slammed, but it didn't stop in the 90s. Right. Jobs are being outsourced every week. There are new ISDS cases being filed every, every month. Yeah. I mean, this is, their one just got filed this week. So we need to do something about this ongoing damage. The agreement as is doesn't quite cut what it needs to do to stop some of that. But if we do our work, it could get there. So my advice would be, especially right now, where you've got members of Congress home for Thanksgiving recess, they're gonna be here for a couple of weeks of lame duck session, and then they're gonna be home from Christmas. They get sworn in on January 3rd, the new Congress. They're home with you, and they're gonna be about and around. 
So number one, look at the public schedules, go to an event, Christmas tree lighting, a menorah lighting, and just you know, grab your member of Congress, shake the hand, very important trick of talking to members of Congress, don't let go of the hand, look them in the eye, and tell them what you need to tell them until they tell you back what you need to hear. And the key thing is getting a pledge that they won't support a new NAFTA unless and until the labor standards are made subject to swift and certain enforcement, Mexico changes the laws to actually make those changes in the agreement meaningful. The bad stuff on medicine is out. Some of these key improvements, cleaning up the leftover mess in ISDS get made. That is doable, but only if we actually push our members of Congress. And then for those new members of Congress who haven't come here yet and been marinated in the Washington scene, now is your moment to grab them at the grocery store, wherever, before they come here and get a really packed, crazy schedule. So I would say particularly focus on your members of the House of Representatives, because the Democrats taking a majority there give them special leverage. And there are broad blocks of Democrats who really have been demanding for decades that this stuff gets cleaned up. So there's a team in there. If we're on the outside asking to get this put in a place where it could be worth having, there's an inside team who's actually receptive. And then there are a couple of rascals who are gonna need a little bit of direct love. Yeah, that's now, doesn't mean if you don't have a chance to meet with one of your senators that you shouldn't raise it Go with them. For it. Uh, you know, and you could even bring, if you're not sure what to say, a lot of folks get nervous, you know, thinking, oh, I'll have to debate you know, a, a very technical policy issue with my member of Congress. No, you don't have to to debate. They're, they're not gonna ask you what Article 17.3 says. What you need to say is that NAFTA is a disaster, renegotiating it is imperative, and the job isn't over, right? And you can say some of the things that need to be fixed are labor enforcement, medicines, you know, cutting out these loopholes that promote outsourcing. You can say whatever it is, is important to you and resonates with you, but that's all you have to say. So it's, it's really, really important to do that. If you're a member of a union, reach out to your union. A lot of different organizations have talking points like this, just one page. If you're not in the union or you want help, you know, as a just individual citizen who's not a member of public citizen, I'm going to actually mercilessly pitch my colleague, Ryan Harvey, who is our field director, R Harvey, R-H-A-R-V-E-Y at citizen.org. He can help hook you up with like-minded activists in your state, the National Coalition of the Citizens Trade Campaign, which is labor, consumer, environment, family, farm, as well as obviously all the unions and local CLC, central labor councils and state feds. Everyone's thinking about this now. Everyone's thinking about how we can work together to try and get some of NAFTA's damage stopped. So reach out to someone who can tell you where your member of Congress is thinking. And also if you want to make it easier, some yeah. talking points, some bullets, but you can all, if you, you can always bug Ryan. I'm volunteering Ryan to help yeah, you Yeah, or you that. can find them on, we've got them on our website, aflcio.org. Super easy, aflcio.org. And like Lori said, if you're a union member, you haven't heard about this in your local, ask your local president, right? Call up your local CLC. They've got the information. And if it's not gotten to you yet, maybe they just need a little nudge or reminder to get it to you. And if you have additional questions, uh, Lori and I also tweet, prolifically. You can follow me on Twitter at C Drake Fairtrade. She tweets prolifically. I'm trying to learn. <laughs> See me on Facebook. Um, the, the, the final thing I would just love to um, have Celeste share with us, and then we're going to go to question and answer is, well, it's actually two things. First of all, I was super impressed and actually moved by the work that the labor movement did with their counterparts in Mexico. Because if you're a labor unionist in Mexico, you have a very tough road to hoe. It's literally dangerous for your life. But also, it's just like smacking your head against a brick wall every day. The whole system's against you. So I would love for you to share a little bit, because I found this totally inspiring, about the work you did to come up with the demands. And this gets to that annex about getting rid of the protection contracts. And, you know, whose ask is that? Well, that's, that's a fight Mexican unions have had. But I want to hear about that. And yeah. then also... I think the labor movement has issued some really powerful statements lately. And I would just, for folks who haven't seen them, you can find them at the AFLCIO.org website. But also before we go to Q&A and folks start getting ready to answer, you've seen across the screen how you can ask questions. 
cue yourselves up as you're getting yourself ready for that. I just want to have Celeste tell us a little bit about the cooperation with the workers in Mexico and also maybe read a little bit of one of those statements. And I think the cooperation with the workers in Mexico, I'm really glad you asked about that because it's really key. And this is where for folks, again, who aren't the trade policy wonks following this all the time, can see the difference between what we are talking about with trade and what President Trump is talking about, right? Because he has to get a point for starting NAFTA renegotiation. That's a good thing, right? And he gets a point for sort of saying, yeah, our existing trade agreements don't work. And then there are some folks who would say, wow, you know, back during the campaign, I, I listened to President, you know, candidate Trump, and it sounds like he's basically using your talking points. Did he download them off your website? And so there were certainly some phrases and terms that he borrowed, but what he didn't borrow and what he doesn't understand is that what Lori announced at the beginning, NAFTA isn't a rigged game where Mexico is cleaning our clock, right? And the Mexican workers are doing great and somehow stealing jobs from us. Absolutely not. These trade agreements are essentially corporate power agreements. They're advancing the global corporate agenda and there are folks benefiting from them. Right. When we say average workers aren't benefiting and the environment isn't necessarily benefiting. Small farmers getting screwed. Small businesses, right? Small businesses. Being driven out of business by the big guys. There are benefits, but the vast majority of those benefits are going to the economic elites. So the big, big global corporations and frankly, the shareholders of those big, big corporations and the CEOs and everybody sort of raking in that dough, the CEO fat cats. So there are benefits, they're just not going to workers. And the thing is, we have more in common with the workers in Mexico who are being threatened, who are having their lives taken away with the small farmers in Mexico who were pushed off their land. We as America's workers, farmers, small business people have more in common with them, have more in common with the workers and the small farmers and the small businesses in Canada as well. And it's really the economic elites at all three countries that are benefiting. And so when President Trump talks about it, it's country versus country, it's nationalist, it's, it's, and we say, nah, -uh. it's actually all three countries could benefit fairly in a way that produces inclusive growth, shared prosperity, shared benefits. But instead, it's really sort of this class system and working people, average people, middle classes are not reaping these benefits and we could be. And so we have worked with what's called the UNT, the Independent Labor Federation in Mexico, not the protection contracts, to say, how could we get this better? And we actually had a lot more, to be honest, ideas about how to reform the labor chapter than got put in there, right? We had these ideas about an independent labor secretariat, how could we cooperate to do cross-border bargaining and labeling goods that were traded unfairly and decent wage boards to make sure, because really Mexico has a minimum wage, but it's so ridiculously low. You, you can't have a decent home and feed your kids on the wage. So we had all these creative ideas that weren't included, but the idea is not against trade. It's not about protectionism. We want to trade together in a way that working people benefit. And that's what we have to do to get worker power around the world is really say, we all have these things in common and what's working against us are international rules that are written for the wrong beneficiaries. And it's and we have to really get that to go. And what we've heard over and over, for instance, during the Obama administration was, it's not trade agreements that have hurt workers, it's globalization. Well, globalization isn't like the weather, right? <laughs> it's, it's a policy choice. And how is globalization implemented? Through trade agreements. So it is trade agreements. And so that's sort of our message. And then that gets to the second part of your question about sort of what are our messages around trade and around NAFTA? And I just want to read, yeah, a little bit about the things that we have said as a labor movement, first, this is just a brief statement from a resolution passed at the last AFL-CIO convention in 2017. It's on their website, but it was so beautiful we put it on our website. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, so, and this also gets at to the other thing that, that unfortunately President Trump has tried to do is really separate out 
the white working class from the rest of the working class as if we're separate and we're not. So we say women, people of color and those with less formal education have had a harder time finding a new job after being laid off due to trade. Whether in service or manufacturing, public or private sector, coastal or middle America, we are all at risk of losing economic ground due to corporate trade rules. It is time for America's labor movement and its allies to join together in a strategic and coordinated fight to end corporate control of trade and create a fair and just alternative for working people around the world. We can no longer afford a short-term whack-a-mole approach to attacking trade deals one by one, nor can we afford to allow the myth to continue that only manufacturing workers in the Northern states were hurt by NAFTA. We must engage in comprehensive economic education with union members and the communities where working people live so that everyone understands the future of our great country is at stake. And, and there's lots more and, and people can read it. And then I just want to read a little bit um, from a statement that President Trump, president of the AFL-CIO, put out with presidents of a number of individual trade unions in response to the NAFTA being renegotiated. We welcome the improvements made so far to the labor chapter, including most importantly, new rules to eradicate wage suppressing, wage suppressing protection contracts in Mexico. But these changes will be meaningful only if we can be certain that the international labor standards in the agreement are strong and that the specific changes to labor law in Mexico are adopted and enforced. We will be relentless in advocating for trade terms that ensure working people in the United States, Mexico, and Canada have the freedom to join together in unions and negotiate for better wages and working conditions. We reserve final judgment on the value of this deal for working families. So in other words, this really is something where it's not just labor, enviros, consumer groups, faith community, health advocates, all getting together. But we also need to all get together across borders because quite frankly, some of these changes that we're asking for, they're the exact changes that our counterparts in Canada and Mexico are asking for. And even in many cases that the governments of Mexico and Canada would want. You know, it's not like Mexico and Canada were begging the US please make us change our terms around Medicine. prescription medicines. They weren't begging for that. <laughs> so we've really got right on our side. We've got good policy on our side. We've got the majority on our side. We just have to go out and do it. So folks, time for your questions and we will answer them. The game is on. Obviously the answer is neither NAFTA's neoliberalism or Trump's nationalism. And the only way we're going to move the needle on that is right now, between now and the vote that could happen on this in the spring, we're all going to have to work really hard on Congress. So first question, Ryan's going to help us by reading out your questions. Ryan, what's our first question? Hey, everybody. Um, thanks all of you for, for coming on both on the call and on Facebook Live. I'm going to start with a few questions from Facebook Live. If you're calling in from your phone, if you just press star six, um, that should, or sorry, six, no, yeah, star six. Um, it'll raise your hand and we will see your hand go up. Uh, and then Jarrell, who's, who's my counterpart here, will, uh, will select you and your, your phone will let you know when you're unmuted, upon which time you can start talking. Uh, I'm going to start with one question um, that's, I think, a, a good one to start with. I've ordered these, not necessarily chronologically, um, but, but based on uh, them flowing together. So this is from Doug Sutherland up in Connecticut. If the presidential signing of the deal is not the end of the story, when is the paint really dry? <laughs> Presumably, each country will follow a slightly different process to ratification. At some point, one of those countries will ratify something. Is mm -hmm. that the last chance to make change, or can changes still be made? So I would say, uh, Douglas, great question. So what the law says under Fast Track is that it is the end of the story. What we know from what Lori described is that actually this is about politics and it's about showing people power and it's not the end of the story essentially when the u.s congress says it's not the end of the story and they say it's not the end of the story when they know that their constituents are not backing them so 
things changed in May 2007 with four trade agreements that were supposedly, they were all signed. It was the end of the story. Panama, Peru, Korea, and Colombia, those changed. And then the Korea agreement changed again in 2011 when President Obama was trying to get it passed a, a, a Congress and even there, he didn't have the votes and Democrats were saying at the time, even though they didn't have control of the House, certainly they may have had the Senate then, you need to make more changes. And guess what? Those changes were made. And the U.S. does have, you know, enough authority in these cases. Generally, the other countries want to be in a trade agreement with us. And those changes are generally accepted. It is a negotiation. The U.S. cannot unilaterally say this is the way it is. But again, much of what we're asking for could be welcome by the trading partners. Yeah, a lot of the changes that would make this a better agreement, they're not the other countries I'm going to be fighting about. And Doug, the you know, the 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 sort of the pain ain't dry until basically it gets to the US Congress. Because in the other countries, you know, Canada's a parliamentary system. When their prime minister says it's done, it's basically done, unless it brings down the whole government in a fight over it, which doesn't happen. In Mexico, there's a very big majority in Congress with a new president to the extent he decides he wants it to go forward then it's going to go forward. It comes down to the U.S. So the other countries basically hold their breath and wait to see what the hell is going on in the U.S. Congress. And that's why they send teams of lobbyists here. And we're not sending lobbyists to Mexico City or to Ottawa that the governments are sending because they know it's here. So the bottom line is repeatedly, if you have a member of Congress tell you, like, I don't know if Congressman Himes tells you it's too late to fix it over in Connecticut, you just have to tell them Bush, too, had to redo the Singapore Agreement all four agreements that 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 Celeste mentioned, and then Obama had to redo the redo. So it happens, yes. it's just a matter of political power, which we need to organize. And that just means soon. So you're asking about timing. Now. Now, now is good. <laughs> now is good. Okay, the next question, this is a short question with probably a shorter answer, but let's see. Uh, this is from Diane Foster. Is there a sunset clause? Yes. Uh, and it's, it's not what was originally proposed and it's certainly not as strong. Essentially what it says is that there's a sunset of 16 years, but within that 16 year time period, after the first six, the countries basically have to show their cards and say, do you want a renegotiation or is everything going okay? And if they all say everything's going okay at that first six years, it puts the sunset 16 years out again. If they say, all is not going well, then they have 10 years between that six year check-in and the sunset <coughs> to renegotiate. And if they ever do renegotiate and they say, we all accept this, that will reset the 16 years again. So nobody really expects it to be much of a sunset as they felt sort of the first proposal was, but it does give us an opportunity, A, what kind of teeth can we put in this in the implementing bill? And B, we now have a schedule by which we can highlight if this thing becomes law, right? Then every six years we can have mounted a campaign because we'll know when that six years is coming to say X and Y and Z need to be on the renegotiate list. So it's not perfect. It's potentially useful. I totally agree. Okay. And basically, you know, NAFTA as is has no timeline. It's like the farm bills all expire after five years. Legislation often has sunset. This just goes on forever. You can have a darn revolution and want to change all your laws and still NAFTA is in place. <laughs> so yeah. the, 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 the notion that there's a time period and that there's the set review is good. It's disappointing that it's not the way it was going to be, which it would have required action to keep it going versus not requires action to stop it. But there's some other interesting things like that that are kind of accountability-ish. So there's a rule in there, brand new, that's super interesting, that basically says if either of the, if any of the countries get into a free trade agreement with China or another non-market economy, then the remaining two countries can decide basically effectively to boot that country out. And that the reason you would think about that is, for instance, those rules of origin that Celeste was talking about, well, if you had suddenly a free trade agreement with, say, China, it would really shape what is made, what the supply chains are going into your country in a way that would not 
be good for raising wages and, and trying to have a, a high road agreement. So that's a cool and interesting term that has, has raised some eyebrows that's in there. The, the, I think the thing to think about with this stuff is the accountability is us. So, yeah. you know, it's being renegotiated because the agreement got to a place. And by the way, it wasn't just Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders. I think if he'd been president, it would have really renegotiated it too. The thing had just gotten to be like a fish in the sun. I mean, it just became a political problem, the stink of the damage. And so that's because we did that. That's because all of you did that. That's because the TPP, after six years of everyone's campaigning around the country, was impossible to get through Congress. It could not get the majority. That's why we're not stuck with it. So we're the accountability. The sunset provision is eh, okay, but we have to make it useful. Cool. Um, okay, the next five questions are all related. Okay. Uh, unless I'm wrong, which you all <laughs> will be able to tell me. Um, I'm just gonna read them real quick. They're all on the same topic. So the first is from Stan Sorcher. The chapter on good regulatory practices is new. How does that work? Why does USMCA seem to have a step backward for every step forward? There's a question from Ken Bonetti out in Colorado. Will language regarding regulation bypass the need for ISDS by forcing nations to tailor their regulations to NAFTA restrictions and corporate rights? Marley Wise said, to what extent does the regulatory coherence chapter undo some of the gains in the ISDS chapter? Selden Prentice asked, please comment on the ability in the deal for corporations to challenge regulations before they are even passed. And Harriet Haywood down in Florida asked, uh, I hope Lori and Celeste might address the possible damaging impacts of the regulatory chapter and the good regulatory practices and how that will be enforced. Well, I'm going to jump in on this because yeah, yeah. we're just about, we're, we're closing in on doing a really wonky detailed analysis of that chapter. So the good regulatory practices chapter actually isn't the thing to be worried about in that respect. Unfortunately, and I'm interested to hear because I know Celeste has a colleague mm -hmm. looking at it too, we've been, we've been combing through it. There's all kinds of language that's offensive and annoying, but relatively speaking, it doesn't really go beyond what's in U.S. law. And it doesn't even necessarily lock in what's in U.S. law. I mean, being able to sadly challenge a regulation in the middle of the making of it um, is something that's there and the corporations use it all the time. Right now, we should use it more to stop the bad regulations because you can basically just by challenging and creating lawsuits and delays, delay a regulation for a long time. It's a tactic we use to stop bad regulations also, but that that's in US law. As well, some of the things like the annual listing of regulations that a lot of people have focused on that's in that chapter, we do that. We already have a whole slate of where you can basically see what the new ones are, the existing ones. That chapter really doesn't have anything particularly new or particularly scary in it. The chapter that's worth looking at in that regard, though, is a one that's never been in another trade agreement. It's one called sectoral annexes. And that chapter has got a variety of different annexes on different sectors, such as chemicals. So the chemical safety one, we think there's some things in there that are damaging, could really lock in bad policies in the sense that the U.S. hadn't changed policies in the area for decades. We're way overdue. Not going to happen with this president. But it's an area where you don't want the handcuffs put on on the substance. And there's some sort of things that our doctor colleagues or public citizens say aren't terrible regarding the safety of medical products and the safety of medicines, they reflect US practice, but those are worth keeping an eye on. The chemicals one, I think is actually something worrisome. And then, you know, the other places just to look is there are more fleshed out chapters on things like food standards and, and what are in trade jargon are called technical barriers to trade that says it all that's otherwise known as environmental worker safety and standards mm -hmm. that could stop trade. <laughs> we call them our domestic safeguards. Those chapters are more fleshed out, but on the substance, they actually don't go that much farther than unfortunately we're already screwed in the WTO. So, I mean, when Celeste was talking about having to have a global movement and not doing a piecemeal, this is our problem. Like another bad thing that's in this NAFTA is it doesn't get rid of the Buy America waiver, the, the, the language that makes us not be able to have Buy America procurement. Well, that totally is a real issue. It's got to get fixed. The problem is Canada already has better than what's in NAFTA 1.0 in the WTO. 
or like in the food standards, the language is just garbage and it's the same stuff that's now in NAFTA. So it's the, the annex, the sectoral annex is chapter though, but we're gonna have a document yeah. on this. And this, this all stuff kind of goes back to what I was saying, the box, the box around democracy. And, and just briefly on the reg regulatory practices question, um, folks might say, well, how is that a worker or issue or how is that related to jobs and wages? Well, what it really does is, is it, and, and some of it's, you know, may and shall endeavor to and not really enforceable languages. Some of it is shall, shall do this. And what it takes is the U.S. current U.S. System. process, which consists of some laws, but a lot of executive orders, which can be eliminated with the stroke of a pen and locks them in. And in some cases, it makes a shall direction something that was an executive order. So it's it's tightening that box and it's saying this is how you have to regulate. And if you have questions about why we would want to change how we regulate, you need look no further than worker safety rules on silica dust. Because that was first identified as an issue for NIOSH, the National Institute on Occupational Health and Safety, to look at in how 19 many years ago. 1972. That's right. 1972. And we didn't even get a final rule until the Obama administration. And now the Trump administration, it's like, hey, let's look at this. We don't really need such a strong rule here. So it's a problem. And I think the best thing to do with that chapter that would be, you know, rather than telling them to renegotiate it, because we actually don't want it at all. If you just took and made it non-enforceable and say, none of it, it's all sort of advisory. None of it counts. It's not enforceable. That could be a positive improvement. But folks should really think about this. We're now going into negotiating a deal with Japan and a deal with Europe. And what are these things that should just not be in there? You know, pull those things out and say, those are not trade. Those are really handcuffs or ways to constrain our democracy and really ways to constrain the, the way that we can regulate corporate behavior. Because that in the end is what this is all about. So great questions. Um, and, and let's think about, and in, in terms of that one question about step forward, step back, well, it's a step forward and step back because it is president Trump. If, if, if you have this vision of fair and progressive trade that puts people on the planet first, you know, this president has some ideas about rigged trade needing to be reformed, but he doesn't come at it from the sense of inclusive growth, shared prosperity, you know, protecting the planet. Oh, you know, protecting all <laughs> workers. He comes at it from this nationalist agenda. And quite frankly, I think there's some, you know, putting in goodies for corporations as there are things that corporations don't like. So, you know, you are only muted. he can explain what his thoughts were about this. But what we can say is it's not good for workers and we're gonna fight to keep what's good for workers improve the things that are not good enough and take out things that that are simply bad you yeah don't unmuted. don't get me wrong we don't like those chapters we don't like any of those rules being in there if you look at our demands we want none of that in there when i'm thinking about what we can do with this agreement and what the test is is sort of a do no further harm test so if there's stuff that goes beyond what we're already screwed in the WTO, if there are rules that like those meds rules that are first time only outrageous lock in, shut our domestic policy space, that stuff's gotta come out. And I agree with Celeste, it'd be very useful to have that whole good regulatory practices chapter not be enforceable, but that chemicals annex is really trouble. <laughs> yeah, let's make that not enforceable too. <laughs> All right. Um, so we've got one here from Nancy Russell Strong. Uh, it's a, a statement, but I think it's, she wants you to speak on it. American oil and gas companies have achieved another big win domestically. USMCA contains a provision that requires the U.S. government to automatically approve all gas exports to Mexico. This overrules previous rights of American regulators to limit exports in the name of the public interest. I'm really glad Nancy brought that up because this is a this is a mis this is a misunderstanding. There is nothing in the NAFTA 2.0 tax that does that. That is absolutely not the case. There is a U.S. statute, unfortunately, that says that whenever the U.S. has a trade agreement with a country, what is normally an assessment for the approval of an LNG terminal, where you have to show it's in the national interest. 
And what's LNG, Professor? Sorry, liquid natural gas. You normally have to have an approval process for those dangerous and, and polluting and unpopular big developments. And one of the standards obviously has to be proved to be safe, et cetera. But one of the other tests is in the national interest. And so there's a multi-pronged test. And one of the standards, which is national interest, that box just automatically gets checked if the U.S. has a trade agreement with the country. And so the statute is what needs to get changed. There's nothing in the NAFTA 2.0 that requires that. But the statute, I'd certainly be like, I'd like to work with you, Nancy, and my environmental friends to change that because simply having a trade agreement with the country obviously doesn't make it in the national interest of an LNG terminal to service them. And that's going to be really important with respect to the U.S.-Japan agreement. So that agreement probably also, like the NAFTA 2.0, won't say a word about that. But an agreement with the U.S. and Japan would mean automatically that box would get ticked. And then the local community is down to just trying to fight the other standards. Is it safe, for instance? So that, that's the answer to that one. And all I would add is that that just shows the overlap of our domestic laws and our trade agreements. So again, whenever you're talking to someone and trying to criticize the trade agreement and they say, oh, that's not a trade issue, that's a domestic policy issue, you've got to say they're so intertwined that as we reform one, we should reform both, right? You can't reform just trade agreements in a box. You can't just reform domestic laws in a box because they interact. So let's, you know, know the, the difference and what needs to change, but it is a, a piece of a larger puzzle. Yeah, and along those lines, by the way, because if someone doesn't bring this up, I want to. One of the things we should get fixed that's like exactly as Celeste just described is country of origin meat labeling. So that's one of those things where we had a very good law. It was challenged by Mexico and Canada. The WTO said, you're not allowed to have that law. And Mexico and Canada got authorized billions in trade sanctions until we got rid of it. So Congress chickened out and got rid of it. So, you know, when I'm jumping up and down the hall about country of origin meat label and people say, well, it's a congressional issue. Well, it's not exactly because the reason Congress isn't restoring that law is because of what the trade agreement rules say. And so one of the things we could get fixed is in NAFTA, we could have a provision that explicitly negotiates a settlement that has Mexico and Canada saying, we back off. We're going to exchange something for something and we're going to let you have that law. And that, by the way, is exactly what was done with respect to the big old fight over NAFTA trucks. So the NAFTA 2.0, another thing that, you know, is on the plus side is there is a there are provisions in yeah. there that restore Mexico won a NAFTA ruling. That's, you know, the, the NAFTA said we had to allow trucks all through North America, regardless of the environmental and labor standards. And we fought that public citizen did to the Supreme Court twice and we lost. So they negotiated a settlement and Mexico agreed that right to have worker, you know, basically worker standards to limit trucks that don't meet the standards is restored. We could do that in cool. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We got a few more. It's 418 just for a time check. Um, I'm going to go through these. Uh, Doug Sutherland up in Connecticut again is asking, does it really make sense for a trade agreement like NAFTA 2.0 to include a specific wage, the $16 an hour? which ignores differing benefits and differences in cost of living in the three countries and which is not indexed to inflation. Should we not focus on empowering workers through improved workers' rights and let them organize for the fair wages in their own countries? Okay, Doug, excellent question. So I'll start with your point that we should be focusing on the right to negotiate a wage. That's critical. And what one of the criticisms that we've said about the auto rule of origin, in addition to not sure how it will work, what are all these intricacies, you know, um, is that it won't work at all if the labor provisions don't work, right? If workers themselves, regardless of industry, sector, employer, do not have a right free from retaliation, free from being fired, free from being you know, threatened with violence to form a union, join a union, advocate with their co-workers for better wages, better working conditions, better benefits. None of the rest of this is going to work, whether it's the auto rule of origin, the ISDS changes, the environmental, none of it will work if workers in Mexico cannot freely organize. So 
that's key. But secondly, the $16 an hour wage, it's not a minimum wage for the auto sector across North America. Again, it and yes, it should move with inflation. And that's one of our key criticisms. And in fact, I was just talking to USTR today again about how it needs to be indexed to inflation. Because first of all, $16 an hour, even for the US and Canada, once you if you compare it to the contracts that the United Auto Workers have, that's not a good wage, right? And if you look at that we're pressing for a $15 an hour minimum wage across the country, 16 isn't much of a stretch, right? But what it does is the Mexico, in Mexico, the auto sector wages, they're gonna vary between, depending on where you are and what part of the supply chain you're in, $1.25 an hour, some are close, you know, up to five dollars an hour. Dollar twenty-five. So if you're between a buck twenty-five and five dollars an hour, the sixteen dollars an hour isn't going to provide those workers a raise, right? They are hopefully going to get their labor rights and start negotiating raises and eventually get there. These things don't happen overnight. But that sixteen dollars an hour is a way to say a portion of the auto and light truck supply chain will be kept in. Canada and the US where they already are paying largely $16 an hour. Now, how it's calculated and the fact that it says it's a minimum, but when you look at the formula, it's actually an average. There's a lot of questions about it, but that single-handedly will not fix the problem. And you're right that the whole idea of, of trade agreements is not to set universal wages across national boundaries. These countries are in different places in terms of their economic development, but it is good to start talking about how do we arrange these trade agreements so that they're a race to the top and not a spiral to the bottom. So it's an innovative provision that alone won't fix everything and we'll see how it goes, but you're asking the right questions, Doug, so thanks. And why don't we take one more question then we'll call it a wrap. And again, folks, get in touch with your local union. Look at the AFL-CIO's website. Look at our website. That's AFLCIO.org or tradewatch.org. Get in touch with your local union um, leaders, your, 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 the, the presidents of your local unions, the CLSU, the state feds, or get in touch with Ryan, our Harvey at citizen.org. And Ryan, what is that last question? Two more questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> There, there's two more that I, I think we should ask because they're on topics we didn't totally touch on. Yeah. So uh, the first one we'll do is from Ken Bonetti again. We should not underestimate the damage intellectual property provisions can do to bias trade towards the corporations and deny people access to health care. Maybe you can speak to that for a moment. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's really because even in, in the space, the medical space, right, there are pharmaceutical brand name pharmaceutical companies. There's a lot of generics pharmaceutical companies that are just waiting for that opportunity to get on the market and give us drugs that are more affordable. And what this deal does is make sure that not only can they not get into our market faster because the US has bad laws that are biased towards the brand names, but it says to Canada and Mexico, you're gonna have to wait longer to get generic competition. And this really is very, very, critical. And, and again, it's the exclusivity period, but it's some of the terms around patents that prevent us from looking at our own patent system and saying, gosh, Evergreen's a really stupid idea. I'd like to get rid of it. Or let's look at uh, what's a fair rate of return on, on patents for, for these cases. Do we want to make reforms to that? It really prevents us from doing that. Now, that being said, intellectual property can be critical for some workers pay, right? We've got musicians. members, yeah, musicians, actors, singers, right? All kinds of folks, variety artists. They're members of the AFL-CIO. And if you do have rules that make it easy to you know, cheat on their copyrights, they don't get very basic payments into their health and retirement accounts. So it's important, but what you don't want to do is have rules in trade agreements, which prevent, you know, protecting the public health, prevent affordable care, and just have a variety of things that are essentially 
price gouging and rent seeking. We don't want to do that with trade agreements. There's no need to do that. And folks, just as a lobbying point, if you're going to talk to your members of Congress and you're in a place where for whatever reason, the member of Congress has not shown sufficient sympathy to the issues of working people, labor rights, heaven forbid they like ISDS, none of those things are going to work. After this election, members of Congress are very, very focused on the access to medicines and affordable health care issue because a bunch of people lost their elections over it. This is actually an issue where you can talk to Republicans who do not agree with you about a lot of the issues. And then you just have to say outright, do you, aren't you like a pro-market person? Do you want a free trade agreement to give monopolies to big corporations to raise medicine prices and just stare them down? Or will you oppose NAFTA until that comes out? Because, I mean, you're for free trade, right? What's that monopoly doing in there? This is an issue that really has legs right now. I think we can get it fixed if we all work on it. And Ryan, what is the last question? Okay. And uh, so the final question, and to everyone on the on the phone call uh, and, and on the Facebook, if you have any other questions you want answered, feel free to shoot me an email, um, rharvey at citizen.org, and I'll try to get you an answer as quick as I can. The last question is from uh, Danny Zesule. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Danny. You mentioned swift and certain enforcement mechanisms. Could you clarify what this sort of language might look like? Okay, great question. So first I'll talk a little bit about the kind of enforcement that's in there and why it's neither swift nor certain. So typically labor provisions and trade agreements, if they're enforceable at all, which was a real question with the NAFTA side agreement, are subject only to what's called state to state dispute settlement. So unlike investor to state, it's countries going head to head. It would be in theory, the US saying to Mexico, you're violating the labor rules, we're going after you. The problem is it doesn't happen. There's no political will. Uh, the, the United States trade representative, the president, the department of state, right? All the players get together and they sort of recommend we don't want to challenge country X on their labor provisions because, well, maybe they're a partner in the war on terror, or maybe some giant U.S. multinational is operating there and is begging them, please don't do anything. Please don't do anything. You'll jeopardize our profits. Right. Or maybe they're housing the U.S. Fifth Fleet. Right. So there's a lot of reasons why they don't do it. And again, this isn't partisan. Democratic presidents have not enforced labor provisions. Republican presidents have not enforced labor it's provisions. Been an equal opportunity disaster of labor and environmental enforcement, cross-partisan. So when we say swift and certain, what we're trying to get rid of is that absolute ability to say we will delay, ignore, obstruct, sit on, uh, consult to death rather than actually enforce an agreement. So by certain, we there need to be some shouts rather than may bring a dispute settlement case if X and Y and Z happen, shall bring a dispute settlement case, right? Or perhaps timelines, like you should engage, you certainly should engage in technical capacity building assistance. Is it a poor country? Is it, is it a matter of resources? Consultations, let's talk about it first. We don't wanna fight immediately, right? You should do all that, but at some point, there's got to be something in the rule, a benchmark, a timeline, a deadline that says, OK, you've talked enough. Action isn't happening. We've got to protect workers because every day that happens, those workers get their wages suppressed, which means American workers get their wages suppressed, which means another decision is made to outsource, which means another union is busted, which means that middle class in our trading partner countries isn't growing, right? All of that. So that's sort of the certain and swift gets at that same question. If there's maybe enforcement, but it won't happen for eight years down the line, which was essentially what happened in the busted up Guatemala case, that's not real either. So what you need to have is action that's quick in a number of days, a number of months, you know, not eight years and certain and ways that you can do that is are varied and we want to be creative we don't want to say there's one certain solution but you could have since we don't have an independent secretariat you could have an independent prosecutor who couldn't be stopped by 
anybody in the government to say, I'm only looking at labor rights, now it's time to enforce. You could have a certification regime that as uh, exports to the US are coming across the border, they have to have a certification. These were made with in the rules of labor. And if you later find out they weren't, what can you do? Can you retroactively impose the tariff or can you maybe hold them at the border until an inspection is done? You could have uh, other kinds of regimes where you say, aha, we found out that you're out of compliance. So all your goods now get held at the border until that's rectified. And then you send them across. Could you have a labeling regime where if there's a complaint that's been made and, and you find that there's evidence to back it up, the things that come in say, this good was made outside of NAFTA labor rules. Like there's a lot of different things that you could cobble together, including changing maize to shells and having deadlines, yeah. right? But, but putting them together into a way that provides the members of Congress who are voting for this, the confidence that labor and environmental rules will be enforced. And quite frankly, the union presidents that they are asking for an endorsement the confidence that they can look at their members in the face and say, we do believe we are confident this is going to make a meaningful difference for labor rights in Mexico, which means it's going to make a meaningful difference to your jobs and your wages here in the US. And that's what we're looking for, not promises that Ambassador Lighthizer is going to be tough because he probably will be. But a promise isn't a legal right. And what one USTR does is not necessarily what the next one does or the next one does or the next one does. So we need permanent terms that create swift and certain enforcement. And I want to just send Danny and anyone else who wants to read more, the lack report, the second part that Celeste mentioned was what their demands are, also spells this out because there are a bunch of super creative ideas you guys have come up with already in this and there's some, some more since. And so that's why we've been super fortunate to be able to have Celeste Drake with us for all this time. Thank you for being so gracious with your time. Yeah. Thank you, everybody who has been on. We're obviously going to have this recording now living forever. So please pass it around because it's really important that we help our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors understand what's at stake and that the time to make a difference is now. By March, it could be too late when the vote could happen. That's as soon as it's lucky to happen. If we do our work now, though, we have a chance to be able to stop some of NAFTA's ongoing damage. And so again, thank you, Celeste. Thank, thank you, you, everyone who's been with us and signing off. Bye. Bye.